Uh, this particular uh, episode of the Nonprofit Exchange is a story of a man who had a vision for something and turned it into a nonprofit, and, and it's the only one of its kind, I think, anywhere. So David Swartz, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hugh and Russell, for having me on your show. Uh, let me make one little correction. We're the only one in the United States open to the public at this time. Great. Others are going to say they're going to try, but we're the only one at this time. And I, um, um, I, I told you I sold a lot of those cameras when they were new. They're so <laughs> older than that. <laughs> I mean, what's the oldest camera you have in the collection? Uh, I have a lens from 1850, uh, whole camera, probably 1868. That's before me. Photography started in 1839. And Stanton, where I'm located, his first photographer was 1847. 1847. Now, they didn't have film back then, did they? No. It was plates. It was called daguerreotypes. My goodness. So, uh, folks, we're having this, this very technical discussion, but we're going to take it off the technology here. We're going to go back to, actually, technology in the right word, technical, would, would, would refer to, to cameras. Let's go back, um, David. <clears throat> We have um, people on this listening to the podcast who will be watching this video who have a vision, an idea for something, and they don't right. know that it's possible. When, I mean, you've, you've done this for quite a while. Talk about, just a minute, your history as, as a merchant, as a photographer. What is your background? What brought you to today? Okay, I came to the store when I was a junior in high school. The president of the business was a 50-year master photographer, Margot Kent. And I liked the uh, portrait side for a while. And so I was the grunt person focusing the camera all the time. And, but I liked the actual pieces of equipment better. So she was president of this business, and I came down to the store, and I just stayed here. And I've been here since I was junior in high school. Now, come next May 30th, it'll be 50 years for me. Wow. Same place? No, different location, same business. Same business. We okay. were just around the corner, so just about a block away. Oh, my goodness. So, Stanton is spelled S-T-A-U-N-T-O-N. That's right. <clears throat> when I ask Siri, she says Staunton. She's just not from there. She thinks uh, she's from New York. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, you have, let's talk about this entity called the, uh, the uh, what do you call this nonprofit? What's the name of it? The Camera Heritage Museum. Heritage, the Camera Heritage Museum. And Incorpor when did you actually form this nonprofit? Uh, December 5th, uh, 2011. Okay, so it's relatively new. Uh, relatively new. The biggest problem was, we, it was easy to get the nonprofit. That was, I thought it would be hard. The hard part was getting the certificate of the state of Virginia to raise funding. So we had to go through the Department of Agriculture to get a certificate so we could raise the money. We just got that about two months ago now. Oh my goodness. Wow. Now we can raise big money. Now before that we could raise small money. We can't we couldn't be get grants or big money before that. So a lot of uh, not a profits, not a, not a profits just start going and they start raising money. They don't realize they have to register with whatever state they're Department in. Department of Agriculture, which is a very unusual, not Department of Taxation, Department of Agriculture. And that may vary from state to state. We're in the, the common, I, we're, you and I are both in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I think we do some things a little differently. So when did you first have a vision for starting a nonprofit? When my son didn't want to have any part of the cameras at all. And I just didn't want to start selling off the collection. Back and up from there. When did you start the collection? I started the day I came, the day after I came to the store. Oh my. I bought a camera at, from a person and paid $75 for it. I was only making 57 64 a week. And I asked for a week's advance on salary to buy it. And my boss thought I was crazy. Well, isn't that a prerequisite for being in the camera store business? I think so. <laughs> all right. So you started a collection. Now, all of these cameras, now people can see the cameras behind you, but that's only a small sampling of what you got. Do you have an inventory list that tells how many items you have in that store? 
Museum. We have a, we have approximately six thousand cameras in the total collection. Not all of them are totally inventoried yet because we have gotten two huge collections have come in, so we have not completely compiled the total collection. So why did you start this nonprofit? <laughs> well, I called Eastman House. They were showing a small version of a small collection down the hallway of in the mansion, but they're not showing the huge collection that's in their main vault. And they said they're never going to show it. Then I talked to Smithsonian. They had two actually small cases, just like what's behind me. And that's what they were showing cameras. Then they took them out and they're not showing any now. Now the only ones they're showing are in aircraft. They're mounted in the aircraft uh, bombs of the planes. That's the only things they're showing. And they put them in the warehouse. So they're not going to show them again. So we decided to open this up as a nonprofit so the public can see what these cameras actually look like. It's nice to see them as a picture, but to actually come up close and almost touch and see what the portions are a big lot different. Sweet. Yeah, it's easy to you. Sorry, um, I, the, 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 um, we had a little question about the the feed for for we're broadcasting this live on Facebook too. So, Dave, say that last sentence again because we had a little noise come on. I'm not sure what the last sentence was, but I'll, I'll give it a try. The Smithsonian and the George Eastman House have huge collections, but they're not going to put them on show. So we had, we looked at other, if there was any others in the United States, and there were no other camera museums open to the public. There's a lot of private collections, but nothing open that people can actually see. And there's a difference when you can actually see it and almost feel it. You get a proportion of size. And what really the photographer went through. Some of these are pretty large, a lot of them are small. So it's a whole variation. They all do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> there are museums for artifacts with the different kinds of collections. Like I was in Reno, Nevada, there's a wonderful classic car correct collection. It goes back the same number of years yeah. as, as your cameras. Why did you decide that this should be a nonprofit instead of a profit business, for profit business? That's a good question. I thought it would be better as a nonprofit. Thought we could probably raise more money uh to get a larger location because this is by far too small uh on the whole exhibit we have on our floor we're showing about one third of what we got and that's not a lot oh my goodness i was amazed when i saw what you have if i'd seen the rest it would have blown my mind um so um, an awful lot of people um, i mean an awful lot of people with ideas and they're they're Straddling the fence. Should I have a for-profit business? Should I have a nonprofit? Now, there's there's lots more regulations with the nonprofit side as far as how you manage the money. And once you true. once you put all the cameras in the collection that belongs to the to the nonprofit, and you That's right, take them home yourself. So um, yes, you're right. There's there's I think when you and I spoke, I teach nonprofits. There's eight streams of revenue that can can fund. And, and David, I, what I see here is you've created a legacy. I like, like to think that, but it's not about me. I just like to see these things preserved because the next generation has no concept of what film cameras are anything about. I live down the road in Lynchburg. I just moved from Blacksburg. And this morning I went down to a frame shop because I got an old house. You got to have those hooks, you know, that hang at the molding at the top, like in a gallery. We're a frame shop also. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I got to call you. Anyway, I went around the corner and there's the Lynchburg Camera Store, and it was like going back yes. in history. And you probably know those folks, but they don't sell old cameras. One of the few, I think it's one of the last five in Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so it's, it's um, when I operated my camera store in Madeira Beach in St. Pete, Florida. I saw 45 over the 17 years I ran this store. I saw 45 camera stores close up. Um, so um, it was in transition. That was just before electronic digital imaging came along. Um, so we're, we're talking today um, to Dave Schwartz. Dave, what is your title with this museum? I'm the curator. 
you're the curator, but you're also the visionary and the founder, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. So you're the one that holds the vision for this, correct? I believe I do. So I want to, I want to talk about um, how do we start up a nonprofit and how do we make sure that our vision is, faith, is faithfully executed. And it's not about you. This museum will live on in perpetuity. And oh, it, will. it will be you know, a legacy and you'll have an endowment fund that's going to preserve it for time in memoriam. And, and if uh, share the vision for the future, you want to have your own facility and certainly a larger facility. Russell, <clears throat> you've been perusing the website. And when you logged on early, we talked about how amazing the collection is. Um, what questions or observations do you have for our guest today? Well, I'd like to welcome you, David. It's good to see you again two weeks in a row. And, and uh, Nice meeting you. You know, I, I just thought it was, uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure what you did, but then I went onto your website and I thought, how cool is that? You get a camera guy to talk about vision. <laughs> I'd like to think that, that well, I would like to think that was deliberate, but you know, if it wasn't, you know, anything to stop the age and mental condition thing. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, endangered artifacts. You know, I was reading some stuff on the site about how many different types of of, of cameras that were actually manufactured and. Uh, and I see that you guys are on the top 10 endangered artifacts list. You've been there for two years in a row. Uh, what is that list and who put it together? That's the Virginia Museum in oh. Richmond. Uh, they're going to change it a little bit this year. So I, I don't know what we're going to be doing, how they're going to redo it, but they're going to change it from what they were the past uh, four or five years they were doing. Yeah. Uh, do you see these older cameras as endangered artifacts? How did how did they come to be categorized as endangered artifacts? Oh, I definitely think they're endangered because I think most of them are getting thrown in the trash or just they're I, really truly they are being thrown in the trash. Uh, one prime example when we came nonprofit December fifth of twenty eleven in January of twenty twelve. Uh, Linda Gray, the uh, curator down at LSU at Lafayette, had a huge collection that they say either we take it or we're going to have to throw it in the dump. One thing about a nonprofit, they have to give it to another nonprofit or it has to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think our IRS law that should be changed, but I can't change it, but that is the law. Uh, we were the only museum open that were accepted. The problem was, was we had, they asked us to pay for the shipping up to us. We couldn't afford it at the time. So I got some friends, uh, Chuck Wilson, down at Wilson Trucking, which is now no longer, they just sold out, uh, was very gracious and gave us from Memphis to Stanton free. It was a beautiful gift. And he got his friend from LSU to Memphis to give it to a very reduced rate. And we got it. And it is a was a wonderful collection, and they were going to just throw it in the trash. So that was our first gift. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah, it, it's it's kind of strange because on the one hand you had people that just wanted to chuck it into the landfill, and and uh, most of these cameras or stuff like this is sitting in private collections. It's yes. kind of like one extreme to the other, and and. Uh, that, how much success have you had at talking with uh, people that have private collections? Are there, are there people, a lot of them out there with some interest in uh, displaying their, their cameras, whether they gift them to you or, or, or loan them to you? What's the interest level? I don't know what the interest level on the gifting to on loan. We don't want to take something on loan because of the insurance and the, the liabilities of it. Uh, gifting, yes, we would love to have. The uh, problem is the families, once these, this is an older generation who like love these cameras. I mean, they've had them for the years and they're just, they become like family. They just don't want to turn them over. When they do turn them over, it's usually a widow or a child inherited them. And that's when we get it. The problem is, you know, it should be pre 
decided upon before the person dies or whatever he wants to do. It also needs to be recorded and they need to be appraised by an official appraiser before they give them to a museum. We have a collection that was just given to us that it was not appraised beforehand and we can't find an appraiser. So we have a huge collection. He drove down from uh, Connecticut, brought us a beautiful collection. Now we got to find an appraiser. We can't find an appraiser. I cannot appraise it by law because I'm part of the museum. We can't find one. It's a problem. There's less and less of us type people who understand this materials. Uh, I hope IRS will change some of the laws a little bit. We'll see. Mm. Well, there's some, um, you know, there's, there's very specific and Russell knows about IRS that was one of his former employers. Um, and there's, there's rules there to protect our, our tax system. But um, Dave, I think it's an important <clears throat> fact. Let, let our viewers know where you are. And if they do have some historic uh, cameras or lenses or any artifacts that relate to photography with film, where would they contact you? You can get us a, a, on our website. We have cameraheritagemuseum.com uh, on our Facebook page. Again, camera, uh, camera Heritage Museum. There's a, we're the only one that's on the web. The only camera museum in the United States open to the public. So it's the first one. Very easy to contact. But first I would suggest go to your accountant first ask, see what the accountant says to do with the appraiser what, before you ship, before you do any paperwork. Then if you want to donate, then you already have your appraising part, which IRS requires. Then we proceed from there. We have our forms on our website for all that, for donations. Great, great. But, but the main thing is the praising first. The praising first. Make sure there's a, a bona fide value. In your narrative, when we were starting, you 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 talked about working for a woman who was a master photographer. That yes. was a, that was an earned title to yes. the Professional Photographers of America, and you had right. to, had to prove your your worth. And there was a whole qualification process to be able to use that term, master photographer. Correct. That's right. She, that was, uh, you, you have to, it's a three part thing. You have to teach, you have to, uh, exhibit and win an exhibits. And then you have to be in the business to do, and it has to work all together and you have to prove yourself as a good photographer. But you worked for somebody that was that, that classic portrait. Classic. And, and then I got, and won my points and everything. And I went to Winona School of Photography and got my. You did. And got, um, proceeded on. I've wow. just stayed and done this. So you're you're more intrigued by the equipment than you are on the actual photography side. I uh, like the portrait side. Still do a little bit of it, but I like the camera part better. Well, let's before we talk. And then the other one you were talking about the Eastman House. That was George Eastman. That's right. And Eastman was, that was Eastman Kodak. That's right. Um, and there was a, a lot of people don't know what the word Kodak means. It means nothing. He made yeah. it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next time he'll dream up something wackier like Polaroid. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good question. A lot of people don't understand. Dr. Land did not create instant photography. He was a tintype. He was a chemical engineer. He just speeded up the process and put it on paper. That was it. Actually, there's a lot of people that, that made things happen that didn't, didn't think it up. <laughs> like the Wright brothers, they weren't the first ones to fly. And they didn't invent it, it already existed. They just were famous for making it work. So Dave, we're, um, we're gonna um, do something visual so the people listening to the podcast can go to the website and look at our video. Do you have any show and tell things you wanna show us? Oh, I got a beautiful one right here. This happens to be a combat graphic from uh, the Korean War sure. and their interchangeable lenses. This thing was they called the Gulliver's Contacts. And it was a great product. 
What, what was its purpose? What did, was it used for? Aerial. This aerial reconnaissance, you just wind it up on the bottom and fire. 50 pictures on a roll. And what was unique about the film that it shot on? It was 70 millimeter, which is three oh. to four times larger than 35. So it gave a lot bigger result, resolution, a lot better clarity. So it was real high resolution, right? Yes. Yeah. Matter of fact, the lenses were made by Schneider Krunzak in Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. What else do you have there? Uh, we got the, uh, this is what most of the press photographers after the war, the Nikon F. This was what you saw at all the newspaper uh, uh, the White House briefing staffs to everywhere, all of the country, all the sports photographers. This was the, the good old standby, the Nikon F photomic. That was back in the 70s. Nikon really made inroads into the, the, the newspaper market because that was, they dominated that market, didn't they? For a little while, yes, they did. Well, now it's Canon, Nikon, back and forth. They, they, they jostle back and forth. Mm -hmm. One little camera I have, and I think this is a, quite a nice little camera. This was owned by Bernie Boston. Bernie Boston was a famous White House photographer representing the Washington Star, then LA Times. And this was the actual camera used when Ronald Reagan was shot. The images that you saw in the newspaper was taken with this camera. Wow. It's got a story yeah. behind it. What was real nice, Bernie and I were personal friends. His widow was on my board of this museum for the first five years. So I've got a lot of his collection. Uh, one of the probably of my finest camera I love, and this just walked in the door, was this camera. And it looks like a, just a big old piece of military piece of junk, but it was the actual camera used at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. Oh my goodness. It was made by Konica. 120 roll film, and it works perfectly as good as day it was made. Now, Konica um, had a really high quality product. I remember um, calling around looking for some lenses and somebody telling me that all the people that had worked at Canon at the time, their personal cameras were Konica because the lens quality was so much better. The Hexar lenses were wonderful lenses, yes. And it's an example like Sony really um, invented VHS, but they went on to perfect the, the format to go beta, but they weren't good at marketing and they licensed J, JVC to, to market it. And, and right. they weren't good at marketing, they were good at inventing things. They've done many mistakes throughout their years, yes. Yeah. It's so, so proprietary, yes. Yeah, Conoco was really good at manufacturing. They didn't quite get their marketing piece together. I think Nikon almost gave away cameras. Maybe they did give away cameras to significant press photographers. So yes. they, they immersed themselves in that market, owned that market. That's right. And I do have one of the military, Leica's. Leica being the prestigious of all the cameras. It's the only loud camera that was allowed in the courtroom for many, many years because it was so quiet. There's no mirror. No mirror. There's a rangefinder. Now, this particular one is the K7A, which is the U.S. military. They only made 550 of these for the U.S. military. And it's, um, it's brass underneath there, isn't it? Brass underneath it, yes. Yeah, and the chrome ones are chrome on top of brass, and they're pretty heavy and substantial. Yes. Uh, I understand uh, up to a certain point, and maybe it's any of them, every Leica that was ever made is worth more used than it was new. Uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of them, yes. That's There's a couple duds, but very few. Like is very good. That's amazing. It's it's a, it's an appreciating asset, unlike other 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 items. So um, what, the name Arthur Felix was a famous photographer. Do not know that one. Um, Ouija. One. Ouija. Oh, Fiji, yes. Ouija. Ouija. Yes. That was his stage name. It was really his real name was Arthur Arthur Felix. Okay, I knew about Ouija. Yes. So what did he do? Do you have anything from him? No, I do not. I would love to have some. I do have uh, oh, John Wilkes Booth's family album. I have uh, Robert E. Lee's official portrait for supposed to be for Washington College. They could not use because he did not button his vest. He did that on purpose because he didn't want to put that uh, suit back on after the war. So he, he was called improper dress. Wow. Um, Alfred Eisenstadt. 
Another good one. Uh, oh, Winston Link. Uh, we have one right down the road from us in Lexington. Sally Mann, a wonderful photographer. She does wet plate clothing. She still does. Amazing. So um, um, Alfred Eisenstein was the famous uh, life photographer, right? Yes. And supposedly he had two Leicas, one with a wide angle, one with a slight telephoto, and he took everything with those two cameras. That's why I said Leica. That's why I have, I have several. We have over 100 in our collection. So, so it's not only the equipment, it's the, it's the eye behind that that's able to capture. I would say very much the eye, but the uh, optics help a lot. Uh, a lot of people think the bodies mean a lot. The body today with electronics, I would say is about 30% of the total outcome. The lens, I would say it was really 50%. And then the other is, if you can know how to, your eye compose the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Leica, the, the lenses with Leica are just as sharp wide open as, you know, mostly you have to stop down a lens to have it really sharp and most, but Leica is well wide design. open. They were the best. Because Os Oscar Bonac, who invented the Leica, had asthma. He couldn't carry the small, the big plate cameras around. So he built a small camera system. But Ernst Lice the second didn't want to put it out until he proved it. Lovely. Do you have anything from the Brady, Brady brothers from the Civil War time? No, I do not. A lot of people don't realize, but most of the Brady plates were repurposed. Um, Matthew Brady himself was going blind at the time because of doing daguerreotyping. Daguerreotyping uses mercury. Mm -hmm. Mercury poisoning. Matt Harris disease. He was he couldn't see. So you had Gardner and O'Sullivan. But those plates afterwards were used, repurposed, and they were put in greenhouses. And they're lost now. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, um, it's clear that there's a whole lot of stories attached to these these precious artifacts that you oh, have. Definitely. So when you had a vision for this. Um, what was the first thing you did? To, to, it was probably before you got this, this nonprofit uh, tax exempt status in 2011. So before that, you started thinking of preserving this collection and moving it forward. So talk about, you know, what was your vision and then what's your vision for the future? Well, my vision then was just the collection, show people. I did not understand nonprofit at all. When I started learning nonprofit, I had to do a lot of self education. Uh, there's not a lot of places where you can find that stuff out, except if you want to read book, read book after book. But they have all the same type things. It's not very easily read and easy to put together because IRS law is very, very specific what you can do with certain things. So, what's your vision, you what's your vision for going, going forward, the future? Uh, we need help. We try and get some new people on our board that are really interested or other people to give us a hand. Uh, we are now trying to acquire the P. Blockley Moss building that is about nine miles uh, east of us in Waynesboro, right off the 64 exit. Uh, Virginia Tech owns it. She gave it to Virginia Tech with six million cash. Uh, it was built as a museum it's ideally suited for what we want. And it's been sitting empty for five years and it's in going in total disarray. I hate to see it happen that way. Yes, P. Buckley Moss is a legendary artist. Yes. And she, she lives in that area and paints the- yes, She does, she lives in Lyndhurst. She has her barn. Yeah, and she paints the unique style. She paints the, the Amish. Yes. Community there, very unique, very famous very prosperous and successful artist. So um, Dave, your, your vision, if I'm, if I'm understanding your vision, is to have a self-standing facility you can display all of your, all of your artifacts. Is, are there, will there be some storytelling or education or other, other kinds of activities? We want to have total education. Uh, right now we're doing a GoFundMe, Facebook. We're raising funding, trying to do some funding that way right now. Uh, but in a, the new, if we get the new building, we would like to have three different dark rooms, wet collodion, the tin typing and traditional dark room and teach it. We would like to have some professors come down from uh, RIT and 
from George Eastman House to give lectures. Uh, we could have almost like a little school there because it's, it's just beautiful location. Uh, it's beautiful scenery to take pictures in. It's, it would be ideal. And a lot of people, you might have a, a class on how to make your photos archival because a lot of people don't realize that the, your, your old photographs will revert to silver over time. Not totally silver. It depends on how they were washed. Right. Uh, what we have done is we have digitized the, most of the collection. We have glass plates. We have about almost 3,000 glass plates. Uh, there aren't, we have, this was an old bank and they're in a vault and they're temperature controlled. Oh. Uh, we have, I handle one glass plate almost every day and it, there is no uh, degradation I can see to it unless you scratch it. it. It's a wonderful product. I mean, it's just, it's almost ideal. And that thing's over a hundred years old. Wow. I'm thinking of just the normal old pictures from the, 30s, 40s, 50s that people have in their in their drawer. Those are they're turning brown. They're, they're turning brown because they the uh, chemist or the pharmacist at the time, because that's where most of them were being processed, did not understand that you had to wash the salts out of the paper. If you wash the salts the longer out of the paper, they will last longer. Even today, if you take that old black and white image put it back in water and wash it for another 10 minutes. It probably could last a lot longer and just lay it flat down and dry. Great, great. Well, um, David Schwartz is a curator of this um, one of a kind in America collection. And um, I bet if there's collections other places in the world, they're not exactly like yours. So it's unique in all it the world, unique. I'm sure. Uh, the one thing I have to say is we have gotten three to four very large other collections from other private donors. There are some fantastic pieces of product that we're going to get lost because the families were going to just throw them away. Well, we'd like to publicize um, that you're taking in collections and, and um, you and I are talking about center vision partnering with you to create your future vision, you know, help you think about your board, and to grow your revenue streams and to acquire, you know, those buildings and those classes to realize your vision. Cause it takes more than one person to launch That's that one. You and I met just by me stopping in, but uh, I do have a pretty vested interest in what you're doing here. And I think I can, you know, we're in conversation about how center vision can help, help this museum be the dominant museum and serve, serve others. And you might even have, I know art museums have rotating collections from other famous art museums. So that is true. the, the, the uh, collections that aren't on display, there may be some negotiation for a partial loan of those. For That's display. what we've already talked to with uh, the Smithsonian. If we become, if we can get the building, because we have to have the museum standards, we'll be part like a satellite of the Smithsonian then we can borrow from their master collection and have That's rotations. And we possibly, now I have not talked to Todd Gutteson, who's the head curator for down Eastman House. Uh, he might be able to do the same type of thing, which would be nice to be able to show these nice old artifacts instead of being locked up and never be seen again. It's nice to see them in pictures, but to see it in real life is entirely different. It is, it is quite different. Russell, what are you thinking? We're, we're nearing the end here. I want to hear what he has to say. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, well, I'm thinking about the educational aspect because just a couple of those cameras that you showed us have a significant history. So, have you recorded that or written some books around it? Or? Yes, we have. I'll just grab one around the corner here. I obtained this one just a couple of months ago. This is one of a hundred brownies that were stereo that were made. They're pretty rare, and. Like I said, somebody was probably going to throw this thing away. And it is absolutely beautiful. And this is from, and I think this was 19.5. Yes, this was 19.5. Yeah. So I think some books on the history, and I mean, you could probably categorize those by manufacturer or by year. And because you've got some. That has already been done. There are book, there's plenty of books out there. That's, that's not the problem. The books are out there, the images are on the internet what we want people to come in and actually see it and we can't let them touch it but i mean they get right up close and personal to it 
And that, it, it tells a lot. It just, it's entirely different than just seeing it on a book. Well, I was thinking if you could get people to read the book or you make some video. That would help, oh, yes. Video tours just to get them to come in would would uh, would be great. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, well, they're rare, but you know, maybe uh, some education, live courses or online courses uh, on that type of photography and the history of photography, just as a way to stir up some interest and that's true people through the door because. I mean, you, you know, once uh, with, with, without dedicated folks like yourself, uh, all of this knowledge, all of this history is in danger of falling by the wayside. That's we're that's not the only one. Uh, yes, well, I mean, we're just in camera, but in, it's in every form of life. That's you exactly right, David Schwartz. You have a passion for something very unique, and it comes across. I look forward to exploring the future with you and seeing how we can uh, at Center Vision be a champion for the uniqueness that you have in preserving this history as a legacy and educating people on what really happened in those those eras. Uh, John Wilkes Booth, Ronald Reagan, you know, those those important places in history where that camera was and it captured that slice of history. Um, you're, you're in, a, a, so am I, I'm in Lynchburg, you're in Stanton, there there, Stanton is a wonderful downtown. It's preserved its history. It has a world-class Shakespeare theater there. So wherever you are, you'll be close to that, but uh, you'll be yes, in Queensboro if you get that building. But um, David, we want to encourage people to contact you if they have collections. We want to encourage people. It's not far off of I-81 going um, you know, up by the, the Shinnah. North and South. We're right at the intersection of 64. Yeah, yeah. And it's easy to get there, and it's not far from getting off the interstate. If you're going north, south, or east, or west on one of those interstates, 64 or 81, um, it's worth worth popping over there, taking a look. And I think right, you're right now, we're like I said, we're right downtown, and right across the road, uh, street from us, we have SunTrust Bank, and they have a most wonderful skylight. It's absolutely huge. Uh, a block up from us, a block, excuse me, two blocks up from us, we have Trinity Church. There are eight Lewis Comfort Tiffany windows in there. Two of them are hand signed. They're priceless. I mean, we have a lot of historical artifacts in this area. Oh my goodness. Well, David Schwartz, you're uh, taking time from your busy day to share with people. Uh, what I want to leave people with is if you have a vision for something, you can make it happen. So put people around you who are competent and make it happen. Don't give up on your vision. I bet you there were times that people wanted you to give up, David, and you said, nope, I'm going to do this. Am I right? I still have people want me to give up. Uh, they want me to retire. I mean, 50 years here, it's, it's, it gets a little tiring, but I love it. And I would love to get some people who are interested in this to come in and help. Well, I'm interested, so let's, we'll be talking more. Russell, um, thank you for being here today. This is a great thing to share, wasn't it? It is, it's fabulous. And so I put some links up for people to find directions and to thank you. donate cameras. And, and uh, information on why to donate. But make sure you go to the cameraheritagemuseum.com website and just check around. Uh, it, it's just fascinating. I never gave old, old cameras a thought. And I'm just kind of curious out of the collection how many of those that Hugh actually owned one of over the course of his lifetime. So I had over 2,300 of them were mine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's a, that's an thing, impressive. Uh, look on, on Facebook every day we put up a new camera and we tell a little something about it. We like to have the new likes on Facebook and uh, Twitter and look at uh, TripAdvisor. You know, they're coming through the area. This is a great spot to stop and take a look at. David we, have, we have two type of tours. We have a $5 tour. You just walk around and take a look by yourself. We have a 750 tour. It's an audio tour we just started. And if you want a self-guided curator myself, it's $20. And I, I spend well over an hour with you. That's a deal, David. And, oh, um, yeah, because there's so much uh, just a wealth of information that, uh, that you can give people. So that's, uh, I'll have to call you when I'm out east. I'd I like appreciate it. There. Yeah, I have to, have to get Hugh out of there before he walks away with some of that stuff. <laughs> We appreciate yeah. you. Russell's, Russell's out there where they have those young mountains. They got points on them. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you all, right. thank you for uh, having me on your show. Great. Well, we, uh, we'll, uh, the, the Facebook feed dropped out. We'll post it up there later on. But David Schwartz, your man who had a vision and you made it happen phase one and you're going to make phase two happen. And um, we're going to partner with you and make sure it happens. Blessings to you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Good day.